Okay, guys. So thank you, Dr. Kromar, and thank you, Dr. Kunos, for giving such amazing talks in, in a timely fashion. So I'm going to try to stay on time, too. So most of you guys, when you think about adult congenital heart disease, this is probably what most of you guys do. Oh, my God, get me the heck out of here. Let me see some other patients, maybe somebody with AS or MR instead. So I'm going to try to do this in 10 minutes and give you a little bit of familiarity because actually this is what I see the adult congenital heart population most of us think is going to be the problem. So why is that? Why is that actually happening now um, in the 21st century? Well, it turns out it has everything to do with history because really the only time these patients could actually start to survive to adulthood was with cardiopulmonary bypass in 1953. There was a little bit of advantage with the blalock tausig shunt, but then thereafter, every decade, we sort of conquered a new lesion um, of increasing complexity, such that here in the 1980s, now we have single ventricle patients surviving for the very first time in history. It's a little bit like Mickey discovering the Sorcerer's Apprentice hat, because now we have all these patients that we don't really know what to do with, and they're trampling all over us. So <clears throat> what do these numbers actually look like? It turns out that in the United States alone, we have about 1.4 million adults with congenital heart disease. That vastly outnumbers the pediatric patients with congenital heart disease. That's estimated to increase about 5% annually. And by 2020, we think it may reach even 2.2 million. Um, and if you think about it, if it's 1% of every live birth and more than 90% of the patients are surviving to adulthood, and you're having about 60 to 70 years of lifetime exposure, and actually Dr. Kerlmeyer has an 85-year-old tetralogy of Fallot patient, we're talking about the probability of you seeing one of these patients extremely high, if not many of these patients. So it behooves all of us to know the basics of congenital heart disease. So, Today, the objectives are going to be the following. What I'm going to try to talk about is a basic framework for understanding congenital heart disease. And then I'm going to talk about some expected issues that arise with congenital heart disease. And then finally, we're going to talk about the indications for referral, which is every patient with congenital heart disease. So every patient with congenital heart disease should be at least referred once to an adult congenital heart disease specialist. So here's the framework. It's not perfect, but for the purpose of today's talk, hopefully it'll work. So shunts, right-sided obstruction, left-sided obstruction, discordance, and then single ventricle. We'll touch on at the very end. So let's start with shunts. So when you think about a shunt, um, much of it is really broken down to into pre-tricuspid or pro-tricuspid shunts. So for example, if you have a pre-tricuspid shunt, such as an atrial septal defect or anomalous pulmonary venous return, most of these patients will actually develop right-sided heart failure, or see right-sided enlargement, or right atrial enlargement and right ventricular enlargement. On the other hand, if you have post tricuspid post-tricuspid shunting, such as ventric septal defect or patent ductus arteriosus, you're actually going to see left-sided heart failure. Okay, so you'll see left atrium, left ventricular enlargement. That is in the setting of a normal pulmonary vascular resistance. As we'll talk about in a lot of our patients, when they get to adulthood, they don't have normal pulmonary vascular resistance, and that's not what you see anymore. So let's talk briefly about atrial septal defects. So you may have heard of premium atrial septal defects, sinus venosus atrial septal defects, and coronary sinus atrial septal defects. And what we often think is it's about the anatomy. It's actually not about the anatomy. It's actually more about the embryological origin, and that's how we ca categorize them. But far and away, the most common atrial septal defect is the secundum atrial septal defect. And luckily for us, that's actually also the one that can actually be closed by a transcatheter method. And far and away, about 50% or more of these defects are actually secundum defects. So what are the indications for treatment for an atrial septal defect? If you have evidence of right-sided overload, so right atrial enlargement, right ventricular enlargement, a QBDQS of greater than 1.5 to 1 or greater, and they have to have a pulmonary vascular resistance that suggests that they're going to do okay with this. So the PVR to SVR ratio has to be less than two-thirds or PVR of less than six Woods units. No matter whether they've been repaired or not repaired, you need to be looking for atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, residual shunt after repair, or even cryptogenic stroke because of residual shunt. Moving quickly to ventricular septal defects, I'm not going to get into the anatomy because that's not really topical for this conversation, but for the most part, most of our patients who have a large ventricular septal defect are probably going to be presenting with Eisenmenger syndrome, where you have a balanced circulation where the pulmonary vascular resistance is at least as high as the systemic vascular resistance, and their SATs may be somewhere in the 80s. The other situation where you may be seeing these patients is presentation with endocarditis. We recently actually had a patient who had a pulmonic valve endocarditis, native pulmonic valve endocarditis, in the setting of actually having a small restrictive VST. What is a restrictive VST? Well, a restrictive VST really means that it's probably not significant hemodynamically. So you don't see evidence of left atrial and left ventricular enlargement, and you don't have an, uh, a change in the pulmonary vascular resistance as a result of severe shunting. 
But even if you have a restrictive ventricular septal defect, they may still develop aortic regurgitation as a result of the aortic valve leaflet being sucked into the ventricular septal defect shunt jet. And so that's something that you need to look for even if you have a restrictive VST. And then finally, if you have non-restrictive VSD, but something doesn't seem right, and they don't have Eisenmenger syndrome, you need to start thinking about whether or not they have some level of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, such as a tetralogy flow type of physiology. So on, on that note, we'll move on to the right-sided obstruction lesions. So right-sided obstructions, just like everything else in congenital heart disease, can come in a host of different places and multiple areas, um, such as everywhere from the tricuspid valve all the way to the branch PA. So if you see one, you need to look for the others. So let's talk about tri uh, sorry, tetralogy fallot. So I won't ask you to regurgitate the tetralogy fallot findings, but here's what the bottom line issue is. There's a right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, there's a VSD, and then generally speaking, the pulmonic valve annulus is also small. So the surgeon, when they do the complete repair at about, you know, these days, less than one year of age, they have to do the muscle bundle resection, so remove that infundibular outflow tract obstruction, and then they have to make the pulmonic valve annulus larger in this baby. So you can't just replace the pulmonic valve because obviously the kid will outgrow that. So what they have to do is try to patch it as large as possible to get them to adulthood to avoid another surgery before they get to adulthood. And then of course they patch the VST. But the problem with this is if you cut through the pulmonic valve and you patch it large, ultimately you're going to need a valve replacement. So what does that actually look like when they show up to us? So this is one of my favorite patients. He's a 36-year-old tetralogy fellow. He's repaired at um, one year of age. And he was dragged into the office by his wife and mom. Um, and he says he's asymptomatic. He does actually do mixed martial arts and can bench press 600 pounds. But it turns out that he has these occasional palpitations. So I put in a vent monitor, and this is what happened the very next day. So obviously, he's not asymptomatic. He's got a serious problem. So why does this actually happen? Well, this is his MRI. And even if you don't look at MRIs on a regular basis, you can see that the right ventricle is gigantic, and the left ventricle has been squashed by the right ventricle. That is what happens when you have 30-something years of pulmonic insufficiency. And so this patient needs a surgical pulmonic valve replacement. So he gets a bioprosthetic pulmonic valve replacement. But the problem is this. He's 36 years of age. If he makes it as far as 15 years with this pulmonic valve, what are we going to do next? So that's where the transcatheter valve technology has become extremely important for these patients because in 10 to 15 years, he's going to need this. So this is the Melody valve. It's a bovine jugular venous valve that's sewn onto a platinum iridium stent and then crimped onto a balloon expandable catheter just like the, some of the TAVR systems. It's introduced via the femoral venous access site and then you can actually direct it um, through the tricuspid valve into the RVOT into the previously placed prosthetic valve. And so this revalving system has been extremely important for these patients because at the 10 to 15 year mark, instead of them going back to the operating room for possibly their third trip, fourth trip, fifth trip, et cetera, they can actually get a transcatheter valve solution instead. So what does that actually look like? So this is one of our patients um, who you can see has actually had multiple trips to the operating room already, um, and he got this Melody valve. So in tetralogy for low, they may say that they're asymptomatic, but you know better. They probably need a pulmonic valve replacement. In fact, the vast majority of the initial TET repairs will need a pulmonic valve replacement. They can have arrhythmias and even sudden death, just like I showed you. They can develop aortic root aneurysm, and they can also develop aortic regurgitation, and they need recurrent evaluation and recurrent intervention. And that's the message that you'll see across the board from congenital heart patients. So moving quickly, the left-sided obstruction, just like right-sided obstruction, it can occur at multiple levels, everywhere from the mitral valve to the aorta with coarctation to sub-AS, as Dr. Um, Dr. Quinone has mentioned, and supervalvar AS. So be aware of looking at all these lesions. So we'll pick out coarctation because it's a nice sort of simple lesion to think about, but it turns out there are all kinds of issues you need to look for there too. So think about this when you're seeing a patient who you suspect for secondary hypertension, especially in their 20s and 30s, and they have a differential blood pressure between their upper and lower extremities. I like to use an ABI as an initial evaluation if you don't do four extremity blood pressures in your clinic. The problem with coarctation is even after surgical repair as a child, you need to look for recurrence because sometimes, depending on the way the surgeon did it, they can have recurrence, or they can actually worse, have a severe aneurysm formation at the site of repair. It can be frequently associated with cerebral aneurysm. So we think that up to about 10% of these patients actually have a cerebral aneurysm. So they need to get some sort of brain imaging at least one time in their life. If they've had it done and they don't have anything, you don't need to do it again. They probably need thoracic aortic imaging on a serial basis. They probably need a CT or an MRI scan done 
depending frequency depending on what they actually have underlying. And then of course very frequently find bicuspid aortic valve associated with these patients too. So I'm going to show you an aortic interruption case as sort of an example. So you can see here a total interruption of the thoracic aorta. And so what we did was we took a page from uh, my training in, uh, in pediatric interventional cardiology where we took an RF perforation wire and we did 3D reconstruction in the hybrid operating room and we burned through using that RF perforation wire. So once we did that, we snared the wire out um, through the left uh, radial artery and we got a sheet across and we're pretty much at that point we're home free because what we can do then is take a covered stent and deploy it and now effectively we reconstructed the thoracic aorta. So this guy did fantastic. After this, his blood pressure was down to 120 on just two medications and he left the very next day. So when you see these left-sided obstructions, be aware that they come in multiple. So combination lesions, aortic stenosis, supervalvar AS, subvalvar AS, coarctation, mitral stenosis. Look for thoracic aortic aneurysm in patients who have had coarctation repair. Look for cerebral aneurysms in your coarctation patients and look for a bicuspid aortic valve in your coarctation patients. So very quickly, um, I'm gonna move on to um, uh, arterial ventricular discordance. So the classic one here is transposition in the uh, great arteries. So in uh, the patient who was born with transposition, you have the right ventricle giving rise to the aorta, which is a bad situation because then it goes through the systemic circulation and then returns blue through the systemic venous circulation back to the right atrium. Likewise, the left ventricle gives rise to the pulmonary artery, which goes to the pulmonary circulation and returns red back to the left atrium, which is not compatible with life. So within the first couple minutes to hours of life, you need to do something to create a shunt. And so what that is, is a rash conceptostomy. So what we typically did was either go from the umbilical vein or from the femoral vein, put a uh, balloon catheter through the PFO from the right atrium to the left atrium and rip a hole into the atrial septum. And that creates a mixing at the level of the atrial, atrial level. Likewise, um, for the first few hours and first few days, you may actually still have a patent ductus arteriosus, which can also help you. But ultimately, you need some sort of more definitive um, surgery. And so for the vast majority of the patients we're going to see, they had the atrial switch procedure, which is a baffler from the systemic venous system into the left atrium, left ventricle, which gives rise to the pulmonary artery, and then baffling from the pulmonary venous system to the right atrium, which gives rise to the right ventricle and the, the aorta. And now you actually have a physiologically compatible uh, uh, physiologically compatible system. But this is obviously still a problem because the right ventricle is hooked up to the aorta, so we all know that that doesn't work out so hot. So this is the first patient that I ever saw with transposition of the great arteries. Um, so he's a 28-year-old man that I met in fellowship. Um, he was born with transposition, he had an atrial switch procedure, and he was playing softball when he was running home and he suddenly collapsed. He had bystander CPR until EMS arrived. Um, he was found to be in ventricular fibrillation, he was defibrillated successfully, and he walked out of the hospital a week later. So this is kind of the typical issue that we have to deal with with these patients. They are subject to heart failure, they're subject to atrial arrhythmias, and they're subject to sudden death, as well as a number of other problems that they can actually develop from the baffles. But what we're now going to be seeing is the arterial switch procedure for these patients, which is what exactly it sounds like. So you take the PA and you take the aorta and you switch them. And nowadays we actually know that you need to move the coronary arteries with you too, because if you don't do that, the coronaries remain hooked up to the pulmonary arteries. But the problem is if you do this in an infant or a neonate, you're gonna have some issues because potentially you can actually cause coronary kinking. So if you kink the left main in these patients, they can get very sick and they can develop a cardiomyopathy. And part of the issue is we, we continue to see this problem even into early adulthood. And so we actually don't know. We may need to continue monitoring their coronary perfusion well into adulthood and with some degree of frequency. Likewise, they can actually also develop pulmonary arterial stenosis as the, they have to actually stretch the pulmonary artery forward to get it to an anterior position. And the reality is these patients are actually coming to an ER near you. So if you have a transposition patient who shows up to see you in their 20s, in all likelihood they actually had arterial switch and you will need to look for these issues. So within my final minute, I'm gonna talk about single ventricle physiology. And quickly, I'm gonna go through the fact that there are three major stages. Um, <clears throat> the second stage, importantly, because this is where we start to see them in adulthood, is that they actually get something called a Glenn shunt. So you completely bypass the right ventricle by using a connection from the SVC to the pulmonary arteries. And then the final stage is something called the Fontan, which is where you bypass from below the IVC to go directly to the PA. So now your pulmonary circulation is fed by just your SVC and your IVC. But the problem with this at the end of the day is you have no intervening ventricle, and so you have no pumping chamber going forward to your pulmonary arteries. So eventually, you can potentially have some major problems. 
first of all, you have one ventricle feeding the entire system, so you can develop systolic heart failure. You can ultimately develop elevated venous pressures because you have no ventricle pumping to the pulmonary arterial system, and that will cause you to have protein-losing neuropathy. And as well as some more right-sided heart failure patients, you end up developing liver failure, cirrhosis, and even hepatocellular carcinoma. And then finally, some of the problems that we have from the residua of actually their initial stages in life is hemoptysis. So in summary, what we talked about is the pre-tricuspid versus post-tricuspid shunts and how they affect things. We talked about tetralogy flow and how most of these patients actually need a pulmonic valve replacement early in their adulthood. We talked about coarctation, how it's often associated by, with bicuspid aortic valve as well as the other left side of lesions. We talked about how transposition arterial switch is what you're going to be looking for and coronary kinking and pulmonary arterial stenosis is what you need to follow. And then finally, in the Fontan patients, I would say refer, refer, refer. These are the patients that you don't want to manage on your own. So with that, I'll stop.